you so much, Mother and, and, and um, Sister Mary. Uh, good evening, everyone. I apologize about tonight um, changing our normal plan, but um, there was a power outage, and you know they give you an estimated time that it'll be back on. And so the problem would have been had we been in the sanctuary, we could have been in the dark, and even if we had opened it up, it may have been trouble getting us on um, um, on on our thread. So I thought it'd be best to um, do this virtually. So thank you for your ability to pivot and join me here on our expectation moment in our normal uh, normal uh, fashion on the Zoom line, on the phone line. It is good to be here with you, uh, each of y'all tonight. I want to just commend uh, my, uh, Reverend, Reverend Edwards for uh, her word last night. And each night this week, you'll get a chance to hear a different word as it relates to um, expectation. And, and many of us will do scriptures that um, are related to or connected with uh, the Christmas season. I want to just say this. Christmas season scriptures are not are not all in the book of Luke or the book of um, Mark, I mean, the book of Luke or the book of uh, John, uh, book of Matthew. Uh, many scriptures in the Old Testament uh, pointed toward Jesus, and many of the scriptures in the New Testament uh, um, fulfill or or declare the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies regard, regarding Jesus. Jesus was always was, and we talked about it very briefly. Uh, this past week, and Jesus always is, and and many many of the prophets were given option by the Spirit of God to declare uh, the reality of Jesus' coming, and many uh, gospel writers were given the option of declaring that Jesus' presence uh, and Jesus' fulfilled work for us. And so tonight, our scripture reading is going to be found in the book of John chapter 1. If you would just join me there, I'm going to open in prayer. Father God, it is in the name of Jesus that we come tonight, Lord, once and again, just to give your name the praise give your name the glory and give your name the honor. We thank you, Lord, for all of your grace and mercy. We thank you for your peace, your joy, and your love. We thank you, Lord, tonight that you, by your power, have given us a Savior in Jesus. You gave us a Savior in Jesus, Lord, that was not theoretical or philosophical, but he was real, he is real. He came, Lord, the way that was necessary for our sins to be forgiven. He came and took upon himself the form of a servant and was obedient to death on the cross. Because so many people... And so we thank you, Lord, that you've given us this opportunity this week in preparation for our, East, our Christmas service uh, to celebrate and reflect, to focus more on Jesus. And I pray, God, that this, these thoughts, uh, these scriptures will get not in our thoughts only, but in our ears, our hearts, our minds, that we may walk, Lord, according to the reality of, we, of, of, of Jesus as our Savior. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, tonight, we're in the book of John, chapter one. Uh, and for those of us who remember some of our studies in John in the past, uh, John uh, presented Jesus, his 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 birth or his existence, I should say, somewhat differently. Um, Luke told a particular story and Matthew told a particular story about um, Matthew dealt with genealogy of Jesus, that Jesus was a film of Old Testament prophecy. Let's let's mute the um, the phone line if we can. Um, Jesus, uh, Matthew talked about the Old Testament genealogy of Jesus. Um, Luke um, gave a very detailed, as was, uh, as was his method, detailed um, explanation of, of Jesus' um, birth um, and, and, and even things that preceded his birth. Um, Mark jumped right in and began his letter immediately. It did not really deal so much with the um, birth of Jesus. And John uh, did something uh, the on the other end of the spectrum. John went back to the very beginning and said, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God, nothing made that was made without him. Now, keeping that in mind, um, John's um, presentation in chapter one, which pretty much sets the table for his entire gospel, uh, declares, um, declares a few key elements, a few key things um, in chapter one of the book of John. If you would just join me there, I'd like to just do what I might call a dusting over. I like to dust over a few things in chapter one of John. So in chapter one, um, again, he says in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He's speaking about Jesus. His his presentation of Jesus uh interest into the world was in verse 14. And he said these words, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory uh, as of the only begotten Son, only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, then John uh, recorded the witness about Jesus, that that witness was not just his own, but that was not his own, but he witnessed uh, the work of, um, of he, he witnesses, I should say, on his own, um, Christ, 
he bear witness of him. And he's speaking now about John the Baptist. Um, he's speaking about him very vividly about his presentation of Jesus. Let me just read verse 15. John bear witness of him and cried, this is he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. John the Baptist was uh, the herald or the, 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 the person who presented Jesus to the world. Uh, and John made that declaration. Um, in, in verses 19 through 28, John denies that he uh, was the Christ. He denies that. He says, I'm not the Christ. You know, John's look was different. John, I was looking at the greatest story ever told, and they portrayed John um, as a man who was kind of radical. And, 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 and I'm sure he was radical to those who were there because he dressed differently. Uh, Reverend Stanley, he acted differently. He ate, had a different diet. He ate locusts and honey. He put on uh, animal skin as his covering. He was not into form of fashion, but he was instead involved in his work of declaring uh, Jesus uh, as the savior of the world. But the, the most powerful thing that was recorded here in regards to Jesus' uh, work for us, I believe, and, I, and I, I shouldn't say that because it's a lot of powerful things, but one of the first powerful, one of the things that sticks out in its presentation is in chapter 29. And so let me just give you a little context. Uh, after John had denied that he was a Christ, um, he does present Jesus again. Uh, verse 26, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. John was was saying that Jesus was that. Jesus was present at that very moment. In verse 27, he said, here it is, speaking about Jesus, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latches I'm not worthy to unloose. John said that his, his not to devalue himself, but John said to elevate the the in, in, in the role of Jesus so that people would know just how important Jesus was. He said he wasn't even worthy of un, un, untying Jesus' shoe, shoe. Now, here comes the timeline. Verse 28, these things were done in Beth Araba, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. John baptized in the river Jordan. That's where he baptized. He baptized people to repentance. Beth Araba was just on the, it was on the other side of Jordan. And so he had this conversation on the other side of Jordan. But look at verse 29. The next day, see is Jesus coming unto him. And so there have been discussions about when this happened, but what we do know, it was after a few things that happened. It was after um, these things are taking place after Jesus had been tempted, after John had already presented Jesus um, by declaring as a dove, um, as he baptized Jesus, as, as he had done these things. Now, this is the third, I think, significant moment of, of Jesus's uh, presentation by John the Baptist. Now, watch this. Um, the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him. I always find it fascinating when I read this verse that Jesus was doing his ministry, but he went back to John, not for a vote of confidence, um, not for his own self aggradation because he knew John would say something kind about him. He came because this was God's intent so that those there present in us today would have a fuller understanding of his work. This is what John said. Behold, behold. That word behold is, is kind of like, imagine going, and being in a store, in a mall perhaps, and somebody hollers out, behold. That's, that's a serious moment because somebody says, behold, they're, they're trying to get your attention. The, the behold is not somebody playing around. Behold is somebody who is, is trying to, to, uh, to get your attention. Um, behold is, is somebody waving their arms and waving their hands and, and trying to get everybody who's around to listen very carefully. And I believe that John, the, um, the, the, the gospel writer, John, the 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 uh, um, the apostle, the disciple, the apostle, later the revelator. John wanted us to stop when we read this word, these words. He said, behold, he wants us to stop and take a good look at Jesus. So imagine if you're at the mall and somebody comes up, somebody says, behold, here comes John. And everybody turns around and says, let me see what I mean. What's up with John? Let me check him out. That's the what John the Baptist was trying to accomplish. He wanted everybody to take in John. And we read these words as well. Think about being a, a new believer. No, an unbeliever, somebody who reads the word. And they say, behold, wait a minute, let me see what's next. Because behold makes you I have an anticipation of what you're about to be presented. John said, behold. And then he says, the Lamb of God. I want to break this down into very small bite-sized morsels. Behold the Lamb of God. And he and it's as if he's putting up a banner. Behold the Lamb of God. Here he is. And then he tells his work, which taketh away the sin of the world. If you read this um, in, 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 without stopping, it's like, behold, Lamb of God, um, who takes away sin in the world. But that's not how John said it. John said, behold, the Lamb of God. And everybody stopped what he was doing and looked at Jesus. And he says, this man taketh away 
the sin of the world. He, here's what I want to do. And I just want to take a few minutes, if y'all give me just a few minutes um, to establish um, what John was saying in a way that I think we can bring us another level of joy and understanding about our Savior. He makes this declaration. Behold, again, this is to, to, to get everybody's attention. And then he moves on and says, the Lamb. The Lamb of God. What is the topic, Lamb? The Lamb. The Lamb uh, throughout the Old Testament. I talked about this briefly Sunday. Throughout the Old Testament, uh, the Lamb was the, the, the priority sacrifice. Um, before uh, there was ever a Savior, I'm back. Zoom. Can y'all hear me? Can y'all hear me? Zoom. Okay. All right. I knocked myself out. So the 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 lamb again was John presenting Jesus as a sacrifice. That Jesus's work. Now I want y'all to hear this. Jesus's work. Um. Then and 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 his work that is fulfilled now is that of sacrifice. Jesus could have come. Jesus could have come with full power. He could have come and, and wreak, wreaked havoc on the world. He could have done a lot of things. The Bible lets us know that even in his last days of his earthly ministry, he could have still called down angels, but he didn't. Why? Because he came to, to do a work. And that work was a sacrificial work. It was not a work that was going to highlight him. It was not a work that was going to make him famous. Although he became famous, it was not a work to make him known, but he became known. It was a work for us, a sacrificial work. And that's why John says, the lamb, the lamb, that was Jesus's main work. He didn't say the king. He didn't even announce him as the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He announced Jesus as the lamb of God. It is the image of the sacrificial lamb. Over and over again, the Old Testament is brought up, but this is how he was presented. Here's what Jesus did. Jesus, was, the Bible says, was slain before the foundation of the world. In other words, before the world was, before there was ever a world that was developed, before there was ever cosmos out of chaos or organization out of unorganization or uh, order out of disorder. Jesus said already this plan was already for him to die for our sins. Jesus uh, is 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 the sacrifice that was necessary for us, God's people, all people, quite frankly, because Jesus' sacrifice wasn't for Christians. It was for the whole world. We become Christian after we receive his sacrifice by believing in him as our savior. But Jesus' work was one of sacrifice to bring us back into a relationship with God in through him. Then he moves on and says, the Lamb of God. Again, he was very clear that Jesus wasn't just anybody, that he was on assignment. I want us to be clear. Jesus on assignment. Some of y'all probably heard this when I was a little boy. I used to love to hear this from Mother, from Mother Yvonne. When preachers we used to preach, they used to say that Jesus came down through 42 generations to be born of a virgin, wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. Love to hear that. Uh, and, and it's true. I didn't understand it, but I love to hear it, but now I understand it. Jesus came from eternity into time on assignment from God. And, and I, I think I, I want to add this to it. There's another one I like to add, that, that there was a conversation and there was a savior that was needed and nobody qualified for that work but Jesus. Jesus took the assignment, came from eternity into time, 42 generations of, of, of mankind and came into the world for the purpose of dying for our sins. He, God was had sent him. He was on assignment from his father. That's what Jesus was. We talked about this the other day. Everything that we talk about Jesus having been able to do, he did it. It was already his. He'd already done it. But yet, he laid aside his glory, the Bible says in, 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 in Philippians. He laid aside his glory. He took upon himself the form of a servant. That's the flesh. And 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 came into the world and died for our sins. He was obedient, the Bible says, to death, death on the cross. That's what Jesus did. Behold the Lamb of God. Now, that's who Jesus is. The sacrifice sent from God. Now, let's go a little bit further. Which taketh away the sin of the world. This is important that we read this in the right context because it's it's even heavier the way it is than it even looks. Jesus came on assignment from God to sacrifice, to be a sacrifice for us. All right. And his work was designed to do this, to take away. This word take away is not just to move it. Like if I'm standing next to you and I take something out your hand, I took it, but I still got it, which means you could possibly get it back if you wanted it or if I gave it back. But Jesus' work was to bear upon himself the burdens or the sins 
or the sins of the whole world. Now, let me see if I can. Many of y'all have seen a, a painting. I think it is a painting that has Atlas standing, holding the whole world on his, on, his, on his shoulders. He's holding up the whole world. That's the work that Jesus did, but more. Now, we learned the other day that Jesus um, by holds everything together. We understand that, that Jesus made everything and, and keeps everything in order. We understand the Hebrews that Jesus holds everything together by the power of his word. But in addition to those things, in addition to that, Jesus' death took away the sins of the world. So imagine your sins, just your sins. Jesus packing them up, put them on his shoulder, and walking out with them. He, they're gone. You can't get them back because he took them. That's the work of Jesus on the cross. And if I was to be dropped in the middle of the, 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 the jungle somewhere, and I had to preach the sermon, that's what I preached. I say, listen, Jesus, who I'm talking about, he took care of your sins away. All you got to do is follow him, trust him, believe in him. That's the word that Jesus did. He took away the sin. It doesn't say sins. It says the sin. In other words, Jesus, Jesus didn't pick and choose whose sins he would take. If you can imagine the sins of the whole world now, now we just talked about looking at our sin. Look at the sins of the entire world throughout time, throughout history, going backwards, going forwards. Guess what? Jesus has taken upon himself all of those sins, put them on his shoulders, and walked away. We benefit from the work of Jesus by receiving Jesus as our Savior by belief and faith. But his work was for everybody. When you run into somebody and they say, I don't know, I don't know if I need this right here. You, you paint a picture for them about the, the destructive nature of sin and how Jesus has taken away the sin of the entire world and that we can experience that salvation that deliverance, that sin cleansing by following him. Imagine going to the store and somebody walks up to you and says, I'm going to pay for all your stuff. Now, what you going to do? You're going to follow them. You're going to follow them right on into the store. And they say, get whatever you want. And you're going to, but you ain't going to leave lose. You're not going to lose folks on them because they're paying for your stuff. You're going to get all that you need. And, but you're going to keep your eye on them because you, you, your, your belief is they're going to handle it with a card, with cash, shit, whatever, Apple pay, whatever they're going to do. The same thing should be true for the believer today and should be uh, paramount to the unbeliever. We follow Jesus because he's paid it all. And the unbelievers to say, I'm looking for somebody to take away this sin. And in that person is found in Jesus Christ. As we move closer and closer and closer to Christmas, let us put our hearts and our minds and fix them on his work. He did. And he was born of a virgin wrapped in swaddling clothes laid in the manger. He, that happened. Um, people can debate where the manger was located, but it was he, he was born into this world. He lived to give us an example of how to live for God. He died for our sins. And as we come closer to Christmas, let us rejoice in the fact that we're about to celebrate the coming of him who is the Lamb of God, who takes away our sin and the sin of the world. I'm going to stop tonight. But I thank God for all of you tonight. And I do pray, and I'm going to pray again tonight, that God will let us have the best Christmas ever because we're focusing on Jesus. I love y'all, and I thank God for you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for all of your blessings, all of your grace, all of your mercy. God, we thank you for your peace, your joy, and your love. I pray, God, that our hearts would be filled, not just with information, but with inspiration, God, as a result of our knowledge and being reminded again of what Jesus did for us. Let our hearts be filled with joy this week, thinking about Jesus, our Savior. God, we love you. God, we thank you. And God, we praise you. I pray, God, you bless everybody on this line, at phone and Zoom, and let us share this good news with the dying world. Tell them about a man named Jesus. God, we love you. God, we thank you. And God, we do praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hold on, Zoom line. God bless your phone line. Are now un